about social science. Maybe I have something on that. This is the, with the nature of science. Uh, in this presentation, I will try. I don't know why you the time, and then not use all the things I have here because that too much. The first uh, point I would like to ask: you, What is sustainable? I could have. Uh, a uh, conceptual definition, but still they prefer a historical one. Uh, we have had in the year 70s uh, the thermal model in AT to the Club of Rome with the idea of zero growth in the world because of the natural resource. This idea had a big impact at that time. The beginning of the so-called ecological movement of the world. That's well known. But the second point is not so well known. Uh, in spite of being from our continent, from South America, was the Bariloche model. Uh, putting the problem that we could have some kind of growth, but not the growth, the industrial and the capitalist growth of the, of the American way of life. While the was uh, I don't know where it is the fox is here. It's fine. Is here? No. Is here? The pointer. The pointer. This is me. Oh, disaster. <laughs> no, I don't need the, the point. Because I am so, so dear. And uh, that was the idea of the Barbosh model, not the kind of, of growth. To satisfy the needs of people, not for consumption. <laughs> And they see that in the years 80, we had a kind of symbol with the also famous report Brentland. Brentland's report has put the question of the uh, sustainable development. That was the answer to the discussion of the two first models. About uh, the problem of energy, the big question is the problem, the link between science and technology. And you need to see that link from a social point of view also. Sustainability is not the only environment, it's also the social. Uh, in spite of the big development after the technological revolution, in particular the problem of the use of computer for different purposes, we have to observe that the big game the big step, the biggest step, was from 
the nineteenth century to the twentieth century. Not now. From the social point of view, in the perception of the common people. Why? Because at the end of the 19th century, we have not the, the gut, the airport, the communication as we have now, the computers, the space technology. A way of verifying in Booker and that is to see uh, two photos of the same place in the case uh, uh, one or more place Praça da Republica in Rio de Janeiro and we see the difference from the beginning of the century 20th century and the middle of the century. This photo is familiar to us. Big building. We have a many big building in any city in the world. And it is not completely different. This remains up today exactly as it is. And even here at the street level we see some cars as we see today, the biggest change was from here to here, not from here to our day. Even if technology can provide the eyes with the smaller computer that they are not equal to the former uh, IBM uh, 1130, of the year 70s in the universe. Now, as you, this here is much more important of computation than the 11.30. But this is improvement of the 11.30. Before the 11.30, the older people like me used the uh, Calculation. Yes. 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 you have uh, an <coughs> uh, arbitrary description of uh, this evolution, the revolution of the human intelligence along with the technological revolution of the, of the computer. Uh, first you have uh, the capacity of to do Using the mind for that many, many millions of years ago, after the possibility of using of the hands to pick up the things and move them, after the language, the capacity of the communicate and have information, uh, after we have uh, the different cultures, the capacity of uh, producing knowledge and the, of uh, communicating this knowledge between people and so on. So far, the, the revolution of neolithical period with the agriculture after the press, the machine, in the industrial revolution, 
Uh, the calculator and finally the computer and maybe we could arrive to the to imitate the human intelligence in all aspects, not only in the aspect of calculating the get information, but the also of the feeling. Maybe. I don't believe. I agree with the the distinguished physicist. Roger Penrose that has the conviction that never to imitate the human mind to have a uh, kind of human behavior in the machine. But while going it near that, fear the evolution of the computation. First, the central system used by the companies, but some uh, organization in a scale of uh, one computer for many people. After we had uh, the personal computer, the PC, at the level of uh, technician, people work in the companies, professor of university in the proportion of the one-to-one personal computer. After the laptop linked it to the big bench wall in the inverse proportion, now many computers for one people in the network. Now the ubiquity of the computer we have computer in our house, it may be in our body if you have some health problem and so on so far. And finally we have our time with the tablet, the smartphone, uh, the computation in everywhere we have. Some new ideas about it. You talk the uh, future like that put many years ago by Alvin Toffler and now by Domenico de Mas. The world is not like they have proposed, but in some way it's nearby. And now I put another question of our countries, many of them in Latin America, in Brazil in particular who exported things of very low value, for instance, in the case of iron and soybean. You see here the difference what Brazil exported and the, the importation of technological products. You see the scale, how many tons of uh, iron, steel, or so I mean, we need to export, to import some technological practice of every, every time. The same you could see here, uh, making the comparison of one ton of uh, a technological product and the one ton of natural product, the, the proportion of can see. The case of China and Brazil, the different flux of money from one country to another. And then you speak a little about our experience in my institution with the use of science to develop technology. Problem that we know very well is the problem of uh, uh, climate change. The increase of global temperature, we can have different results, but the whole thing again with the very strong increase of the temperature, the global temperature, and the, the reason for that, maybe for the emission of greenhouse gas big part from the energy system. 
solution as the uh, CCS carbon capture and storage should be possible, but up to now this is too expensive and not exactly solved technologically. That could be a possibility. To solve this problem, we need to think about the possibility of change of the standard of life. That standard of life developed along the, the industrial evolution and the, the, the dominate all the world. Brazil has some advantage, for instance, to use hydro plants. But to have a big discussion on that from the other point of view, not only about the climate change, you see, there exist other problems from the ecological point of view for making big dams. This is the commitment of Brazil in the year 2000. 2020. This committee was the, the presented by, pres, by, by the President Lula in the Copenhagen conference to have this reduction up from a project, projection of groups of a Brazilian mission that's possible to be to be exactly like that because of the reduction of uh, deforestation in Brazil that was the main source of greenhouse gas in Brazil. But this is changing completely. Now the situation tends to be like that because we have reduced too much deforestation in Brazil while the energy emission is increasing. So we have changed from this situation to that situation here. So uh, now we need to be careful also with the emission from uh, energy. And the situation is not <coughs> how many? Two minutes. Okay. But the situation is not very good because while increasing the emission in the electric sector in Brazil using for complementation of hydro, using thermal plants, and we have also reduced the participation of ethanol in the transport sector because of not very well uh, solved relation prices of the field. I will finish with these two following uh, exactly like that because of the reduction of uh, deforestation in Brazil that was the main source of greenhouse gas in Brazil. But this is changing completely. Now the situation tends to be like that, because we have reduced too much deforestation in Brazil, while the energy emission is increasing. So we have changed from this situation to that situation here. So uh, now we need to be careful also with the emission from uh, energy. And the situation is not <coughs> How many? Two minutes. Okay. But the situation is not very good because while increasing the emission in the electric sector in Brazil using for complementation of hydro, using thermal plants, and we have also reduced the participation of ethanol in the transport sector because of not very well uh, solved the relation between prices of the field. I will finish with these two following uh, figures. 
in the world you can say that developed countries are not reducing the greenhouse gas emission enough. And developing countries like the Brits and the Brazil in particular, they have the tendency of increasing emission because of the development. The and inside each developing country, the income class of, of the higher position, they have the same standard of consumption of the developed country. While we have a base of society, the big part of population with very low energy consumption. So we reproduce inside the developing country the difference you have between rich and the developing countries at all. That idea I could put, I don't know if I have done my exercise, but uh, that was good present here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank uh, the opportunity to be uh, participating in this event and especially the invitation I received from Elisa Reyes. And uh, I think uh, the issue of uh, this event is uh, extremely relevant. And I have been uh, dealing, uh, fighting, <laughs> stressing about this kind of uh, uh, exchange uh, in terms of uh, social sciences and natural sciences because I am part of uh, uh, an interdisciplinary PhD program in, uh, in uh, Florianopolis, Santa Catarina, where I am from. And uh, so um, I have uh, a lot of ideas about this, <laughs> these problems and uh, possibilities and opportunities that uh, the relationship, of course, uh, opens for us as researchers. And uh, I try to put uh, together uh, some of them uh, to do my homework, as <laughs> my previous presenter mentioned. No, I, I try. Uh, to do that and I hope I can reach that result. Uh, so I think that there are uh, new challenges for this dialogue between uh, social and natural sciences. One of the challenges uh, is related to uh, the uh, redefinition of uh, the decision-making process uh, around controversial issues that are fundamentally uh, related to uh, new technologies, emerging technologies, that bring uh, different type of risks than the risks that we knew uh, previously at the, uh, to the Second World War. As uh, Ulrich Beck uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, well-known well book about the society, the new risks that we are facing are uh, well, environmental health risks, but they are global, they are democratic, because they are uh, affecting different uh, populations not necessarily uh, inside uh, the container of the nation state. They are invisible and uh, generally they are irreversible. And so um, in facing this kind of uh, risks, uh, the demand for a more democratic uh, decision process has uh, been developed uh, in social sciences, mainly in environmental sociology, 
social theory, social studies, science and technology, and political science. Uh, there is a confluence um, uh, in relation to uh, overcoming the, the dichotomy between lay and experts, and um, so how to involve the uh, lay people in the decision process. Uh, in general, the developments, the theoretical developments about an empirical developments as well of this proposition, I have some uh, limits. And I will present a um, uh, research uh, that uh, uh, where I participated that try to face this kind of challenge. And there are all challenges still facing us. Uh, now, this uh, is uh, uh, now, uh, related to global warming, but is uh, the relation between realism and constructivism. This uh, conflict, uh, this divergence, uh, is not only uh, between social sciences and natural sciences, but as well is permeating uh, social sciences as well. Um, so what, it, what I mean with this, uh, the, the realist uh, perspective uh, that is very related to the positivistic uh, approach uh, states that uh, the environmental problems, let's say, are objective and are independent of our uh, perception of them. And so we need to uh, quantify uh, the risks, uh, we need to uh, manage the risk and at the end of the chain of uh, this risk analysis, we need to communicate to lay people which are the risks. Uh, the constructivist perspective that has been uh, obviously more predominant in social sciences, but not uh, exclusively, because realist pers uh, perspectives as well are present, emphasizes that uh, in a more uh, radical uh, position, let's say, of constructivism, that the perception of the risk are more important. Uh, but what we can see in uh, the last decades is that there is a, a balance between these two positions, especially in social sciences, between uh, realism and constructivism, leading to a, a more uh, realist a constructive perspective, perspective. So risks, of course, are objective, but it's very important to understand how lay people and also scientists uh, from natural sciences understand these risks. This means that uh, uh, we have there a very rich uh, arena uh, uh, for a dialogue between uh, social and natural scientists. But not always this is easy no, to uh, develop. So these are, uh, I, well, I have in Portuguese, but they are, uh, these are the differences between uh, realism and constructivism uh, in social sciences. This is uh, from an article of mine, but shows that uh, in social sciences, most well, there is no consensus, as there is no consensus about anything <laughs> in social sciences. But, well, so my presentation, the presentation will focus in uh, two cases. One related to GMOs, and the other related to climate change, uh, and how they are uh, facing these uh, dilemmas and challenges I spoke uh, now. So in relation to GMOs, how uh, the new practices for risk governance are uh, a demand or not, uh, and uh, how uh, are the relations between lay and expert knowledge, <coughs> and which is the role of mandated science. This is something very important for us, because mandated science uh, is a concept 
that addresses uh, the intermediate, the boundary uh, situation of many scientists that are advising public policies. And so, which are these scientists that are behind uh, some public policies and what interpretation of the social and of nature they have and what interpretation of, uh, they have a more realistic, more uh, constructivist perspective, etc. So this is a very important issue, I think, that uh, in our uh, space now uh, we need to consider. And the other example uh, is about um, uh, the need of new concepts uh, uh, inside social sciences uh, to lead with uh, climate change. Um, I focus here in a research I am participating, and uh, Ana Maria Vara here too is participating, uh, coordinated by Ulrich Beck, and about uh, climate change. And he tries to bring new concepts uh, as emancipatory catastrophes uh, to bring uh, climate change inside a new uh, theoretical perspective that is very interesting for social sciences and how social sciences uh, so in this case we have uh, of, of In this case, we have how uh, social uh, natural sciences can become uh, more complex, incorporating the perspective from social sciences. And here we have the uh, opposite case: how social sciences can learn something from um, natural sciences. So, in relation to uh, genetically modified organism conflicts. Uh, it's important to uh, highlight that they are not only about risks, but they are also about uh, which is the process of innovation in the field of uh, life science and also in the field of politics. Uh, and how this relate uh, this last point with uh, uh, what in social sciences is conceptualized as civic epistemology that means uh, the political culture of uh, a country uh, mainly. I will go faster because, um, so there are some important differences in how uh, the conflict took place in a different uh, context. In the US there was no significant reaction, although now there is a pressure for labeling growing and growing. In many countries of the European Union there was a reaction and there was a, a process of democratization of science in many cases, uh, like uh, the uh, UK for example, and in Brazil we had uh, a reaction but without democratization of the debate. The debate became very, very restrictive. And um, so uh, in relation to GMOs, we can also um, speak about uh, two uh, polar positions uh, about uh, the governance of risk. Uh, these two and, uh, uh, positions uh, are constructed in the intersection of two uh, issues, the conception of the public and the conception of science. So we have first the standard model, that's the most dominant model we have uh, to uh, live with as uh, social scientists mainly, and because uh, it emphasizes that there is a big distance between lay and experts, and if the lay people don't believe in what experts are saying, it's because there is a deficit uh, in the knowledge of the lay people. So it's important to have more information and more information uh, given to lay people. And then they will be in accordance with the uh, truth that natural scientists mainly have. 
And uh, the other is a negotiation model uh, that is a new territory. It's uh, an area very uh, new in some way uh, in terms of uh, experiments and in terms of uh, theoretical development. But it shows that there is no um, necessary um, uh, division between lay and experts, there are different perceptions, and this is more related to the co constructivist perspective, and the other is more related to the realistic perspective in terms of uh, the role of knowledge. So uh, this doesn't mean that experts will disappear, of course, but which, are, which is the role of lay people? Which are the perceptions they have, and how they can be included different voices can be included. And I am not speaking exclusively about NGOs that not that uh, not necessarily represent voices of uh, different sectors that they try to represent. So there are many forms of uh, public participation, uh, referendums, public hearings, public opinion service, negotiate uh, rulemaking, uh, consensus conference, citizen jury panel, citizen public advisory committee, focus groups, etc. And this is uh, interesting because they, it shows how there are many strategies to incorporate the, uh, the public. The problem is who is the public? That's another question. I'm not going to uh, answer this now, but. Um, to uh, open the debate, to be more transparent, to be more, um, to have more, uh, science, uh, to have more accountability. Uh, the first research was uh, coordinated uh, by Durham University with funds from the Jean Templeton Foundation. It ended uh, now in 2014. And um, I, um, uh, these were the questions. Uh, the, the idea was to understand the different perspective on uh, GMOs, and uh, which will be uh, the main um, strategies for uh, a more uh, participatory decision-making process. The research was a comparative one and took place in Mexico, in Brazil, that was the part I coordinated, and in India. And uh, it involved ethnographic fieldwork, uh, well, all this methodology I will not go through. So, and we have a final workshop uh, at the Royal Society in London, now in June, where we presented uh, the results of all the research. Um, in the case of Brazil, particularly, I analyzed that the controversy about uh, GMOs took different uh, moments, and now we don't have an open controversy. We don't have a controversy. The controversy ended. Uh, we have uh, the NGOs uh, lost the battle, and um, but there are new coalitions that are very interesting. And uh, so I analyze here the different coalitions we have in relation to GMOs um, and how uh, uh, mainstream uh, economic actors uh, readequate themselves in the global market uh, uh, context. So we have the still the anti-GMOs that is a, mi a minority, it's uh, very radical, and we have pro non-GMOs and pro-GMOs. So the pro non-GMOs are not against GMOs, are the same actors uh, dealing with uh, all the market, <laughs> no, all the demand from uh, some parts of Asia and mainly European Union. And doing my homework in terms of sustainability, <laughs> that's the, the issue of uh, the, this table, the anti-GMOs have a perspective on uh, 
sustainability very different. All the sectors have very different discourses, and uh, this had a very uh, the anti GMOs have a very um, a critic uh, also to organic production, criticisms to organic production because they are mainly against the market. Market is the same as capitalism, so they are against and they defend our policy and more uh, other type of uh, livelihoods, let's say. Here we have uh, sustainability as environmental management, and here we have uh, sustainability as syn synonymous of eco efficiency. With, uh, so, different uh, perspectives, but uh, for the market, because both are market driven. So, uh, we did ethnographical field work. I have uh, I will not enter here in this, uh, this process. We did focus groups with the uh, urban consumers, and uh, I need to go faster. <laughs> there are very interesting comparisons, uh, because in this, for example, uh, among the focus groups, uh, there is uh, trust in government. The government is trusted and uh, also uh, scientists and uh, not the media, not the seed companies and not uh, always NGOs. No, that's and uh, among scientists we did research in uh, different uh, laboratories. No? Here was Embrapa Socha uh, in Londrina and uh, there are very interesting comparisons because we can see how the standard model of science is extremely strong, extremely consolidated among these researchers. So this was seen uh, among uh, all the uh, three countries, you know? and uh, the idea that we produce the knowledge and the farmers need to accept the knowledge we develop. And uh, this division of labor as well, two minutes, okay. Uh, well, it can be seen in the problem of wheat resistance now in relation to GMOs that is very spread and not secret for anybody. Uh, if you go to a farm fair, everybody is speaking about this and the problem for the seed industry and the seed representatives of the industry the, seed, the representatives of the seed industry <laughs> are blaming the farmers. The farmers are not good. It's the same as it happened before with pesticides. The farmers are bad because they are using too much and in a bad way and not following the recommendations, the scientific recommendations. But what we can find is that the, this uh, recommendation of le uh, levels of acceptance of residues, residues or practices, different practices, are a kind of science fiction and in practice are not viable for the farmers. But farmers are very happy, what I could see in my field research, with uh, GMOs, uh, mainly soybean, because it, uh, the advantage is not in terms of productivity and in terms of rent, but it's in terms of uh, reducing the field work. And that's an important issue. That many of the NGOs that are against GMOs can't understand the point of view of the farmers. Well, um, we did a national seminar, etc. And this is the big, uh, I can show to somebody who can be interested before. This is the other research, I'm, I'm going to take more two minutes to explain, uh, is uh, called Cosmo Climate, and uh, is funded by the European Research Council, uh, and uh, the title is uh, Methodological Cosmopolitanism in the Laboratory of Climate Change, coordinated by Ulrich Beck and an international team participating in this. 
and the idea is uh, to show how um, uh, climate change can open a very important uh, space for uh, uh, for change that no other risk presented. And um, so, and how this relates from the local to the global, and also, um, well, the idea is to analyze the dominance of uh, a climate narrative and how it's permeating different social actors. And um, uh, Ulrich Beck is bringing new concepts because he thinks that in social science we have uh, like Sunni concepts you know, that are very old to analyze new uh, challenges. So we need new concepts and so he's uh, it's very interesting to be participating in this research and to be uh, seeing how uh, theory is done in the making. You know? And uh, so he's speaking about the cosmopolitan term that is very different from globalization because uh, it uh, means that for social sciences uh, we need to escape from the methodological nationalism and try to understand uh, uh, in a different way the situation of uh, the, these uh, climate, the, 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 the opportunities that climate change brings in terms of political and social and economic terms. Um, so the research is divided in two blocks, uh, analyzing uh, uh, cosmopolitan uh, climate change uh, one block is analyzing, uh, one uh, issue is uh, the role of uh, green uh, cities. The other is low carbon innovation networks, where I am participating, and the other is mediating global risk, with the role of media. And the other is, uh, the other package is uh, how to develop a new methodology to have a better dialogue with uh, natural scientists in relation to this. Uh, so, um, so I will go uh, further here. And uh, going back to the example, I, uh, what I try to show is how there is, uh, in, in two particular cases, are possibilities of uh, very productive uh, dialogue if we uh, put, uh, we explicit, make explicit our presuppositions about uh, more epistemological presuppositions. I think that they are very uh, central, very crucial for uh, being able to establish a, a, a dialogue. And together with epistemological uh, presupposition, our value presuppositions. Values are not obviously only permeating social sciences, are also permeating natural sciences. So uh, we need to um, have more self-esteem social scientists to dialogue with natural scientists, and natural scientists need to be uh, a little less uh, self-assured of their beliefs so uh, we can uh, have this space uh, for uh, dialogue. So thank you very much. Well, the last decade has seen an impressive increase in the global discussion of climate change and its consequences, and the need to implement an effective, sustainable form of development. For many years, the social sciences seem to be out of this debate although many voices alerted about the importance of human agency in this process. It is, however, only more recently that the importance of the perspective of the social science to understand, analyze, and support effective transformation towards sustainability has been recognized. Some of the important agents for this are here today. Uh, ICSO, the International Social Science Council, UNESCO. In their different areas of activities, they have insisted 
in the central role of social sciences have to play if sustainability is to be achieved. And now they have united with other players to form Future Earth, a program that clearly claims that co-design and equitable partnership mark a new phase for the collaboration between natural and social sciences. I would like today to add my voice to this debate and spell out what changes when you use a social sciences lens to look at science, technology, and innovation. So let's first of all have a look of what is being said regarding to social sciences. First of all, there is a growing recognition that without the social sciences, it is not possible to understand the new global context, for they not merely describe, retell, and count the already familiar, but they provide new conceptual tools to understand reality. These concepts and findings are essential for any effective public policy. In fact, neither the physical and biogeochemical processes nor the rates of change can be fully understood apart from their anthropogenic impacts and origins. But in spite of that, climate change research is still very small among social scientists. Uh, Bausset mentions that many barriers for a stronger social science presence in climate change research, among which the subordinate role of social sciences in predefined agenda, a divorce of agendas between natural and social sciences, and not least, an enormous difference in funding for social sciences research in climate change. But she does mention one aspect which I think is central. If social sciences are to advance scientific knowledge on climate change, they will need to strengthen their disciplinary basis at the same time as they open their disciplines to greater the interdisciplinary training and education. And this is a very difficult balance. So uh, what... Uh, <coughs> If we look at what is being said, I think I can uh, cite here uh, what has been said by Hackman and her co-authors, that uh, uh, we need a new kind of social science, bolder, better, bigger, and different. And citing their own words, bold enough to reframe and reinterpret global environment change as a fundamentally social process, better at infusing social science insights into real world problem solving, bigger in terms of having more social science involved in this, and different in the sense of reflecting upon and changing its own ways of thinking and doing science is theories, assumptions, methodology, norms, and incentives in order to contribute effectively to meeting the vexing interdisciplinary and cross-sector challenges that societies face. Uh, they have, to face this, provided a very interesting research framework which they call transformative cornerstones. And I'm not... Uh, um, detailing this because I'm sure uh, she will talk about this later uh, tomorrow. But what I would like to say is that although I totally agree with this framework and I think it is very interesting and all compassion, I would like to say that uh, there is one other layer of complexity that is needed if you want uh, to really understand sustainability and uh, um, sustainable development. And I would like here to cite another out of the ISSC report that says that whether assessing the impact of environmental degradation and climate change or building effective governance institutions a rigorous gender analysis will deepen and broaden our understanding of environmental problems. 
and help find relevant, effective, equitable solutions. It is now commonplace to view economic growth through the lens of environmental sustainability and social equity, including gender equity. But it's still relatively uncommon to view sustainability through a gender lens. Rigorous empirical work on gender and environmental change is even more rare. So why is the gender perspective important in addressing environmental change? And why, especially in developing countries? I would like to bring our attention to a recent report of UNTAD in 2011, when they apply a gender lens to STI. And uh, the report uh, suggests three entry points for introducing gender as a, uh, as a category in STI policy and analysis. Echoing many previous reports, such as the Pioneer International uh, IAC uh, Women for Science report and the many European Union Commission reports in the subject in the early 2000s. The first is Science for Women. The second, Women for Science and finally Women in Innovation Systems. Let's look at what they say when they talk about uh, Science for Women. The first entry point is important because if you look at sustainability, you necessarily have to think about actions, perspectives, commitments, and you clearly must use gender to fully understand how activities of men and women differ, and how therefore both the way each uses and acts upon the environment is different. As different is the impact of climate change and environmental degradation upon them. This is especially important in rural societies where rural activities are still central and where women are responsible for the gathering and preparation of food, linking, therefore, their everyday activity with relevant issues such as energy, water consumption, use of biodiversity resources. However, it is also important in um, developing countries with a more advanced level of urbanization, where men and women have very different uh, Activities and can react and use very different resources available to them, and so on. There are many examples. The use of water, how uh, less access to irrigation will affect women's ability to cope with delayed rain or uh, without technology support, they will be less accessible to new, more heat resistant crop varieties, and so on. But these differences may also be found in urban areas. As we saw in previous of our colleagues' presentation, uh, poverty has a face. It is uh, female, it is black. Uh, um, violence in Brazil has a very definite face. It is male, young, and black. So to be able to understand what are the public policies that will directly affect and resolve these issues? Uh, gender is an important, uh, important uh, uh, variable. The second uh, uh, entry point for using gender in, in science, technology, and innovation is women for science. And there you have a much broader and much larger uh, body of literature in four decades. Since the early discussions of uh, the feminists in the early 70s, much has been advanced. And what you see, you have identified the factors and the processes that underline the limited access of women in certain disciplinary fields and in higher positions of the science and technology and system. Here, the analysis is much more refined. You look at recruitment, you look at retention, you look at advancement as the central uh, moments of a scientific career and how this affects differently men and women. 
and also you look at excellence, how excellence is assessed, how funding and pay caps still persist. Finally, the third entry point is uh, women and innovation. And here you have very slow advances all over the world, but also in developed countries. Representation at senior management level is still very small, and in, there is a increasing number of small entrepreneurs, but lack of training and support. So well, what all this uh, reports and uh, studies give us is a series of recommendations that I think echo many of the recommendations that we have heard here today. That goes uh, into incorporating a gender dimension in the SIT biologies, and especially in those policies, and link those policies on food, agriculture, water, energy, infra infrastructure, and energy. Conduct impact assessments of all policies relating to SCPI for development to ensure that they benefit both men and women equally and promote women's participation in decision making at all levels. Also provide support for scaling up successful models and approaches to appropriate financial and policy measures, promote equal sex access to resources, education, and increase the capacity of women and girls at the local level to appropriate information and education. But I think that one important issue that has been highlighted is the issue of how you need uh, to really a data collection that is gender focused at all levels. If you collect data about um, sustainability and environment change using the family as a unit, you don't understand how inside the family that are really strong divisions and that need to be highlighted. So I think that it is not a trivial question how you collect your data. It will influence the questions you ask for your research how you, um, the, the empirical analysis you will understand, the policies you will formulate. So I think it is absolutely essential that gender disaggregated data on the impact of environmental change or on green institutions is absolutely essential. And although qualitative assessments pro provide rich insights Gender analysis also need more rigorous empirical testing of propositions that is found on existing literature. So I will end here saying that uh, 